Jeremy, I want to start with you first and get your reaction to Tillerson's response to the moron comment. Look, he's not denying it, right? So what does this tell you? Uh, it tells me that he said it. I, I mean, I, this is pretty clear. I think it's been pretty clear since the day the story was first reported, and he refused to answer the question of whether or not he said it. He absolutely said it. My reporting, Alex, uh, tells me that he, he not only called Trump a moron, he called him an expletive moron, uh, in not exactly language I want to use on, on television to say exactly what he said. But no, th 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 this, this rift between the president and his secretary of state is very real, and the likelihood that Rex Tillerson remains the Secretary of State three, four, six months from now, I think, is very thin. Well, again, this is someone, Rex Tillerson himself, saying he'd be surprised were he to last out an entire year. He said that a few months back. But um, Tillerson is also trying to clarify the president's position on North Korea. He says he's seeking diplomacy. But then here's the president's tweet earlier this week. Here it reads, presidents and their administrations have been talking to North Korea for 25 years. Agreements made and massive amounts of money paid hasn't worked. Agreements violated before the ink was dry, making fools of U.S. negotiators. Sorry, but only one thing will work. So Josh, he also told Tillerson in a tweet, you know, don't waste your time trying to negotiate with North Korea. So who should the public believe? I, I have no idea what the Trump administration's strategy or position is here, and I, I don't think the North Koreans know either. Uh, there's been some interesting reporting about the North Koreans basically trying to do what, I mean, we used to talk about Kremlinology, where we would try to figure out what was really going on inside Moscow and the Soviet Union, that the North Koreans are doing that, trying to figure out what's going on inside Washington. They find it very confusing that you have top of Republican officials contradicting what the president says, including people in his own cabinet who he could theoretically fire. And I, I think part of what underlies this is a truth in what Donald Trump is saying here, which is that we've had 20 plus years of North Korea policy that hasn't worked. Um, and But it's not that one thing works, it's really that nothing works. Um, the d d diplomacy has not been a successful strategy, but there's also no viable military option there. So I think he wants to define himself in opposition to these presidents who failed, saying he's going to do something different. The problem is he doesn't really have a something there other than making threats on Twitter. So my hope is that, you know, we I mean, for months we've had a lot of noise here without any, you know, without any actual military action on either side. My hope is that can be a sustainable situation uh, through the rest of this presidential term. But I, it's not clear to me that there is any bigger plan beyond that. Well, again, Josh, to your point of not really knowing what the president means by his words, I want to play this sound from Republican Senator Susan Collins this morning talking about the president's choice of words. Let's take a listen. What the president needs to realize is that his words really matter. When he makes an off-the-hand comment like the, the calm before the storm, as he did recently, both our enemies and our allies analyze that comment to figure out what it means. He does not have the luxury that he had when he was in the private sector of saying whatever comes into his mind. So, Jeremy, more and more members of his own party are taking issue with these cryptic messages that come from the president and the potential harm that it could cost. How damaging might that be to the president in the long run? Does it render him ineffective in someone who says, oh, yeah, it's just the president tweeting again, who cares? Right. Well, the problem uh, that, that, that Susan Collins put her finger on there is that often there is no deeper meaning to these comments. The president is, is a deeply impetuous man, and he f flies off the handle, tweets something, and, and often there is no real thought or strategy behind it. It's just being intemperate. And I, I think, though, while you're seeing a handful of senators like Susan Collins uh, and, and John McCain speaking out, questioning the, you know, the, the, the president's stability, uh, Bob Corker, of course, they remain and will remain in the minority of the Republican conference in the Senate. That's just not going to change until Republicans start looking at President Trump's poll numbers and seeing them drop below 90, 85 percent approval rating in their states and their districts among Republicans. It, the president remains popular with his base, remains popular with Republican voters, and, and, and the political courage that's necessary to stand up to a popular president, um, in, 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 the popular president among his base at least, it's just not there. You know, Josh, can I ask, with, with regard to what the president says, and oftentimes we try to explain it away as saying, well, he's appealing to his base with whatever he's tweeting out. But how does that play out internationally? How much do international leaders understand playing to the base and interpret his words as such instead of something directly to him? I mean, North Korea, for example, Iran. 
Well, I, I don't think that the tr tweets about North Korea are exclusively about appealing to the base. I think the president has a broader idea that it's important to project strength, that when somebody punches you, you have to punch back, at least rhetorically. Um, and this is something that, that you saw throughout his career. And then, I mean, even if you read in The Art of the Deal, he talks a lot about, you know, publicity seeking and, you know, you can you make grand promises. He calls it truthful hyperbole when you say something that is, in fact, not truthful and, and a big exaggeration, but he thinks it, it, it indicates an underlying lying truth. So I think, you know, I, I think the president, he kind of just talks and he talks a big game and he's been used to being able to, to make big threats and big promises and not make good on them. The problem is that more people are paying attention than ever before and, and the stakes are higher than ever before. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't chalk this up exclusively to a domestic political strategy to appeal to his base. I think that he thinks that when you're dealing with somebody with like Kim Jong-un, who's, you know, who, who's a bully and who's, who's, you know, making bigger threats than he ought to, that the way you have to deal with that is by threatening back in kind and I think that's why he does it. Hmm. Okay. How do you Josh interpret the president Lindsey Graham playing golf yesterday for the second time this week and then Senator Rand Paul also spotted arriving at the president's golf club this morning. Well this is interesting because both of these are senators who have at previous times been very much not in Donald Trump's good graces but you know just like he fires Omarosa and brings her back and fires her again and brings her back this is another long-standing aspect of Donald Trump that you can be his enemy and then later be his good friend. I think you know Lindsey Graham got in the president's good graces by trying to resurrect Obamacare repeal sort of bringing that back from the dead and well not succeeding, but at least seeming to try really hard. Um, I assume what's uh, something that's got to be at the top of Lindsey Graham's agenda right now is uh, adjustment of the Iran deal. Um, so it's a good time for Lindsey Graham to have the president's ear and to spend as much time golfing with him as possible. Rand Paul has sort of oddly become kind of friendly with the president, even though he's actually been one of the most frustrating people in the Senate for the president's uh, putative policy agenda. He's been critical of the tax plan that Republicans have released, uh, saying that the tax plan raises taxes on many middle class families and needs to be adjusted for that. And of course, he voted against the last health care repeal bill. But I think there's something about his style that the president likes. Uh, and both of them have sort of feuded with the uh, establishment Republicans in the Senate, including Mitch McConnell. Yeah, I think the president also appreciated Lindsey Graham giving him a, a shout out with his when he shot 73 at golf <laughs> earlier. I mean, yeah, that's a great score. There's no denying that. That's when, for sure. When he allegedly shot a 73. Oh, there you go. OK. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.